six. So this is the sixth in our series. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background for those who are new, this series is really about giving you sort of tips for designing your own electronics. Um, everything we do here is available for you to download. Um, it isn't yet, but uh, there will be a link uh, on the Makeup Make, Make Space uh, page. So uh, everything which you do here will be available to download. If the display does go a bit hazy, um, please let me know, because um, obviously on my screen, it will look absolutely fine. Uh, there will be a chance at the end, it's about half an hour. We'll, we're gonna look at a few bits and pieces together. And if you've got any questions, you know, you can keep them to the end if you'd like, or um, say, just chime in. That, that's quite okay with me. So this particular time, we are going to have a look at um, five aspects of um, designing reliable electronics. As there's nothing worse than making something and you discover it doesn't work or doesn't work particularly well. Um, there's no maths in this. Um, so, you know, just sit back and enjoy it. Uh, my name is Stephen Clements. I've been designing electronics for 27 years now. So uh, you never stop learning. And when it comes to reliability, um, certainly, uh, definitely never stop at all. Right, so uh, reliability, a little, little introduction here. Um, reliability can really make or break a product. And so we're going to look at a few things. We're going to look at a, little, a tiny bit of PCB design because that's where it all starts. Although the next session we have next month, we'll talk about PCB in a lot more detail. Uh, we'll have a look at cables because uh, um, cables are the undoing of most electronics. And, and then we'll, we'll dig into a little bit onto one of my favorite subjects of radio emissions and radio immunity of uh, electronics. And, and finally, a little bit on ESD. So maybe around half an hour. And then uh, we will open the floor and comments, questions, anything you like um, then. Right, okay, so without further ado, let me just get rid of that page. So I thought the place we could start would be actually, um, well, let's see if I can refocus that a little bit better. There we go. Um, hang on, let me see if I can brighten the screen a little bit for you. Uh, no, someone's been messing with my camera. Hang on a second. Is there exposure I need to adjust? It's a little bit brighter, I think, if I do that. There we go. Looks like we're outdoors. Right, so let's start off reliability talking about printed circuit board layout. Uh, now, I've got two boards here. They, they look similar, but um, they're not. On the left here in green, we've got a two-layer PCB. And here on the right in blue, we've got a four layer PCB. And so we'll just have a look at the stack up and what that means in just a moment. <clears throat> do you go two layer? Do you go four layer is the first question. Well, it really depends on what you're doing. I think we can probably see here with the blue board, there's a lot more going on than what we've got on this green board. And so if we try to fit this on a two layer board, this blue one, we'll probably find that the size of the board would get considerably larger. So I think the first takeaway really is um, two layers isn't really always worth the saving. And uh, I've got a few notes here. We'll have a look into that in a bit more detail. If we just move those out of the way. So what do we mean by two layer or four layer? Why do we care? So we've got a few drawings this evening. So this say on the left here, this is a two layer. Um, think of it like, like a two layers of a sandwich. This is the top layer. And on the top layer, we'll have some signal tracks. We'll have some power. And we'll probably have some ground zero volts. And 
we're probably going to have to do exactly the same on the bottom layer. So we've got quite a lot going on with a two layer board and it can get quite complicated and you can certainly very quickly lose reliability um, straight away by going two layers if it's a busy board. If there's not a lot on it, then sure, probably stay with two layers. And if you look at most development boards, like, you know, like the Arduinos, for example, or the nuclear boards, they are all on two layers. With a four layer board, which is our blue one, it may seem more complicated, but I guarantee it, it's easier. We have a top layer, which is signal tracks. And think of it like a club sandwich. We have a, a buried layer, which is right in the middle and you just can't see it because it's in the middle, which is then ground. And we'll look at this in a bit more detail in just a second. So I've got some pictures. The next layer down, it'll be power. And then the fourth layer, which of course is the bottom is signal again. So by going four layers, I guarantee it will be a lot more reliable to start with. Just wondering if I could lock this lens for us so it doesn't keep refocusing. That might do it. How does that <laughs> increase the reliability? Is that because of the better shielding? Um, no, well, in terms of power, um, well, in terms of shielding, <laughs> good first question, brilliant. Um, it's, um, it's easier with with a with multiple layer PCBs, say four layers. That's the standard I design to these days. Um, <clears throat> what you'll find is, as you'll see in just a second, is um, the the return path for the electrons um, have an easier route back to base, shall we say? Um, so you'll get a lot less emissions. And as we go through, you'll, you'll hopefully see that a little bit. But um, just to emphasize that, if you bear with me, because uh, I've got some pictures here just to try and emphasize why this is. So this is our two layer board just here. This is a picture of it. Um, so this is taken from the layout, um, which I've done for this board. So this is two layers, green, and the power, <coughs> I've had to track it around the board, which is red is the top and uh, blue is the bottom. So it's got a bit of a, a wiggly path uh, around the board. Um, and of course, I do have to have lots of decoupling and uh, things I have to think about here. Um, uh, <coughs> there was, um, yeah, you, you got lots of, um, <coughs> throw me a little bit there, hang on a second. <coughs> With the two layer board, uh, say we've got to track our power. So we'll probably start to introduce noise into the track signals, we'll lose integrity of the power itself. <clears throat> so if you're then running to say microprocessors, <clears throat> because you haven't got a clean power supply anymore because you've tracked it, um, <clears throat> you, you can start to run into reliability issues with clocks will start to be affected. So the way I try and get around that in a two layer board, <clears throat> is oh then the next page here these are all my grounds in their little bits sort of peppered all over the place so <clears throat> i'll then try and then infill with the ground so if i'm using two layer i'll only track the positive power rail but <clears throat> i will try and fill in the ground as much as i can so this red here on the top this is all my ground and on the back side of the PCB, <coughs> I filled in a little bit more with ground and then I'll knit the two together with lots of vias. This via spacing is five millimeters. So it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and if you start getting a busy board, <coughs> this does, does not work. So if we have a busy board, which is um, this blue one, what I've managed to do in my blue board is my club sandwich. 
one of the buried planes um, in the board. If you remember, I had signal, ground, power, signal. <clears throat> one of the layers of my club sandwich is nothing but ground. You don't slice it up. You don't try and be clever with cuts. You just do one solid ground and it'll be so much more reliable. <clears throat> and uh, I've learned that one the hard way. <laughs> And then the layer below that, um, my power is, again, just solid power planes, no tracks. <clears throat> and by doing it this way, if you've got a complicated board, you haven't got to worry about how am I going to track the power in and out because you just use a V and go straight down to a plane. So it's instantly um, an easier job. And I don't really think there's much saving in going two layers unless um, and if you've got lots of space for it. <clears throat> uh, right, OK, that's as much as I really wanted to share about two layers and four layers on PCB. Um, when we talk about the next session next month, we'll dig into PCB design a whole lot more. But you know, a, what I'll say is a, a schematic done perfectly, if the, if the layout's all wrong, um, the whole thing can go to hell in a handcart very quickly. Right, the other thing that's guaranteed to ruin your day is cabling. <clears throat> so I've got some examples of some cables here for us. <clears throat> so, uh, I've got here, this is a fairly cheap cable um, with a really, rather naff looking screen on it. So um, this, this, I got this sample from Maplin some years ago for this purpose. So not a lot of screening on that cable. That's fairly rubbish. Uh, on this cable here, I've got much better screening. Uh, and there's also this, this inner, hopefully my camera's working called C, okay. I've got, I've got this inner um, shielding as well. So I've got much better shielding on this cable. But don't assume just because you've got a shield on your cable, it's going to solve your problems. Shielding works best when you anchor both ends of your shield to, to zero volts or ground. We've only got one end grounded. It'll work, but it won't be nearly as effective. The other thing which you find on cables um, is you often find these sort of ferrite blocks. Uh, you find them a lot on, well, this is a USB cable, it's got one. <clears throat> so these are for suppressing uh, f low frequencies. Uh, you now maybe around sort of the 30 megahertz to maybe 50 megahertz mark. <clears throat> so they don't stop everything. In my view, these are what I would call an expensive sticking plaster. Because um, frankly, you know, you're better off trying to fix a reliability issue on your board with a 0.1 penny capacitor than, you know, a two pound lump of um, ferrous material. Hi, Stephen. I don't know if you're aware, but you're only really getting about one frame a second out of your overhead camera. Is it? Right. OK, let me see if I can turn off my camera of me. Right. So hopefully if I turn off my video, that might improve. <clears throat> and maybe if I won't move things quite so much, that might help. No, still about the same frame rate. Um, you might need to dump the resolution slightly on the overhead camera. Oh, let's have a look, see what we can do. Right, let's try uh, that. Uh, is that improving things? Oh, yeah, yeah, that now you're on sort of four or five frames a second, maybe, the way you're moving the mouse around. Right. Well, the good news is that everything I've got here is kind of static. So uh, I'll, I'll try and leave things there and then hopefully um, it, it won't move, move along without us. Can we go Thanks. back to the um, grounding the shielding at both ends? Yeah. I've heard the term ground loop without really knowing what it means, but or why it's a problem. But it sounds like that would be a ground loop. Um. Yeah. Well, 
I, I don't normally, you know, with my sort of low power electronics, I don't often have too much of a problem. Um, see if I can find something here that will help us. Uh, I had the same question about whether it would create ground loops. Uh, right, one moment. Let's see what we can do. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, I think um, say with digital electronics, I've never really had a ground loop because things are usually quite short together. What what I have found with a lot of shielding is if if I only have one end grounded, I don't get quite the same level of. Um, uh, so you see, <coughs> emissions, well, we'll talk about emissions in just a moment. I don't get quite the same level of screening as, well, as what I'll do if I, if I ground both ends. Um, but um, a lot of it does depend on, on, on how close things are together as well. Question, um, when you say ground loop, are we actually talking about earthed at both ends? So you're actually creating a, a complete loop between the shielding. Yeah, and yeah, the... I'm making a better circuit for sure. Yeah, not just like, you know, grounded to the circuit. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing is here, um, which I find slightly more useful is, um, right, hopefully if I draw this nice and slowly, is um, if there's ribbon cables, um, what I'll do with a ribbon cable is, if I can draw this, is there's a ribbon cable, this is a classic one. If, if I'm doing signals over ribbon cables, which clearly there is no screening, um, is if I do a, say a five wire cable, yeah, hopefully that's nice and static. Uh, I might do ground here, G for ground, then signal, then ground, then signal, then ground. So you don't always need screening. And screening only really works at certain frequencies. If we're going at low frequencies, you probably might find your screening isn't really doing anything for you at all. Or if I've got a differential going over a cable, um, let's say I've got seven wires. I had to think about this before. Obviously, I drew this. Uh, one, two, three, four five, six, seven. <clears throat> I may have ground, uh, signal plus, signal minus, ground, signal plus, and that might be, say, signal one, signal two. If that makes sense. Ground. <clears throat> so there's multiple ways you, you can actually solve the, um, so, so, solve your reliability issue, should we say, with cables. As I say, cables are the undoing of everything. Uh, you can get uh, ferrous clamps for cables. Um, it's one I happen to have in the drawer. And I've certainly got some horror stories around these for you. So, you know, you, you can get clamps for cables. Um, you can get ferrous materials for cables. There's you know, three different types here. And often you just end up sort of experimenting uh, and to see how much works. Some years ago, I was working on a medical product with a display, and displays are one of the worst things for reliability on radio emissions. And uh, we found that um, the company claimed they had done all the testing for reliability. And when we tested it, we found they patently hadn't done anything whatsoever. And uh, you know, we ended up actually having to put clamps on their cables in their display in order to make the thing work properly. But these really are all very expensive sticking plasters. Um, you know, and as we'll see when we talk about uh, radio emissions shortly, um, they don't buy you that much um, in terms of making it a, a better product. You know, if you can solve the problems at the electronic design, it'll definitely bode much, much better, make it cheaper, increase your profit margin, all the things that we like. 
So, okay. Um, so, PCB layouts and cables, don't skimp on it, I, I would say. Take your time with it and uh, do lots of testing. Don't assume just because you've done a layout, things are going to be perfect. Um, they very rarely are on the first, first attempt. So radio emissions, this is one of my favorite subjects. Right, so, okay, hopefully you can see that okay. Just zoom in a little bit. There we go. And focus. Right, so for those um, who um, aren't aware of radio emissions, this is a picture here of what's called an anechoic chamber. Every bit of electronics, whether it's your digital watch or the computer, you're know, watching this on this evening, everything emits radio waves. And we have to test for it and make sure that those radio waves aren't too high because no, nobody wants to interfere with radio three. Not that anyone listens to radio three. But essentially, this is an example here of what's called an anechoic chamber. At one end, you have your piece of test equipment. And at the other end, you have a radio antenna. And you go to a test site here in Cambridge, just north of the city in Cottenham. Uh, there's a company called, uh, I think it's DB Technology, who can do this. I used to go down to a place called ETS in Stebbing near Braintree. If you've never done any of this work, it's a brilliant day out. <clears throat> and, and essentially what we're doing is we're monitoring the radio frequencies coming off our piece of equipment to make sure that they're not above a certain level. And we'll look at that in just a second. So this is a small chamber. It's probably the size of, say, a shipping container. It's fairly standard. Or uh, there's another one here, which, as you can see, is really the, you know, uh, if you go up to Coventry, Myra, you know, they get buses, helicopters, you know, all sorts in and make sure they're not, not overdoing it on the radio waves. And I've got an example here for us. To give you an idea. This is a project I worked on some years ago. So when we're looking at reliability in terms of radio, uh, we're looking for 30 megahertz all the way up to one gigahertz. <clears throat> and there's a, a limit line here in green, which you must be below. Don't ask me how they come up with these numbers. I really don't know. <clears throat> and uh, so this was actually for a set of scales for weighing in a supermarket. And as you can see here, we are clearly above the limit. So we've got to do something about it. As you can see, they're, they're, they're sort of almost like lots of sharp peaks, which means that this is actually coming from a clock. And you've got to go around your design and try and work out where is that coming from? In this particular design, believe it or not, it was actually coming from an ADC chip. And when we turned the ADC off, things quietened down quite considerably. Uh, these peaks here, you can see these are still clocks. And you can find that these peaks can be, and if you had a clock, say, at let's say a 10 megahertz clock, for example, which is below 30 meg, you can get harmonics when we spoke about timers where way back when in January, I think we spoke about timers. Um, a 16th harmonic, which would be say 160 megahertz can very easily then manifest itself. And in here, you know, we've only got up to 150 here because we were just, in our area of interest of trying to work out what's causing our problem. And really we're ideally, you really want to be, this is a dB scale here, decibels. So this is, you know, 10 times differences. It's, it's quite substantial. And you'll generally find that the background noise, I could just draw the background noise on here, usually looks something like that. 
so whilst it's going up here that's actually background noise so that's not a problem but this round here is your radio stations that you listen to they're somewhere around here so we don't want to interfere with them so after a lot of work with this particular bit of design and a lot of filtering work going on uh, we came back and we managed to um, get it down to that which is really quite acceptable I think and it, you can go around putting things in metal boxes um, but again metal boxes are expensive and with a metal box you're not actually stopping the radio you're just attenuating it so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to actually be able to solve the problem just because you got into a box in fact if your metal box has just got bolted on bits of metal together <clears throat> those bits of metal can just end up just bouncing around and resonating <clears throat> and not stopping the radio at all <clears throat> and so you do you end up having to do lots and lots of testing um, at a test site uh, it's, it's called pre-compliance which if you're designing a commercial product uh, I think most places will charge about a thousand pound a day um, but uh, if you are developing a product it's a thousand pounds very well spent and it'll probably save you 20 to 50 thousand pound later on and uh, usually you, you, you've got to go through the pain barrier once before you realize I really should have gone for pre-compliance to test this product. Uh, and just as an example here, I, I have here printed off for us um, all the things that we did. So, you know, so we can maybe see here, um, our top ones are reference, it was a fail. So we, you know, we started playing with the power supply. Yeah, things got worse. So power supplies, there's a problem. Um, you know, we started plugging cables in and out, got slightly better, but not great. Uh, we then added a capacitor and all oh, things got better. You know, so you do, you have to, you'll end up doing an awful lot of tinkering uh, with different ideas. You know, we've got here different capacitors, like here we had one capacitor and it wasn't, or four here, it wasn't enough. Then we added some more capacitors and things got better. So, you know, whilst the design will look absolutely perfect, <coughs> uh, when you go and test it, you'll find it's probably not so great. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer to go for four layers to start with. It really does improve your chances of everything being much better from the start. And uh, yeah, you will end up spending quite a lot of time scratching your head. And as I say, <clears throat> this is a dark art. Um, you just end up having to uh, tinker, tinker, and then tinker some more. Um, just a, another horror story for you. <clears throat> um, power supply company, very well respected in the electronics industry. Um, <clears throat> they said they'd done their testing when we looked at their testing results they'd done them all wrong um, if you take a switch mode power supply <clears throat> usually when they test them they put the maximum load on to get the maximum current out and then they do all their all their testing <clears throat> but the thing is with a switch mode power supply it has its best efficiency when it's maximally loaded <clears throat> If you then drop the load, so you're not drawing quite so much current, uh, they roll off the efficiency curve. Say, so rather than going from 90, then down to 70%. <coughs> and then the emissions will go up. Um, so, you know, so company who said they'd done their work, they'd done it all wrong. So, you know, I think the moral of the story is when people say they've done the work, um, don't trust them. You've either got to do it yourself or you've got to ask them for the test data. And if they have done it and done it properly, I guarantee they won't be able to give it to you quick enough because they know, they've, they know that they've done it. If they always hum and ha, then chances are they've either tried to pull a fast one um, or they've done it wrong.
is there equipment that you can buy at the sort of high hobbyist level yeah basic tests yourself yeah and this is one of the things i do at home actually but you know before um uh uh, uh an ordinary radio is a good one okay um yeah if you could just use an ordinary radio and just go around you know uh, and and see if you can interfere with you know radio four for example uh okay. another one you can do just trying to find it with an oscilloscope lead. Oh, in fact, I've got one in here. Bear with me. I'll get it out for you. Radio 4 long wave or FM? FM. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's worth asking. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the other hobby thing you can do with your ordinary oscilloscope. Just getting this out here. We should have got this out earlier for us. Um, here we go. So this is just a, a coil of wire. And I, I'll just connect one end to my oscilloscope probe, which I haven't got in front of me, and the other end to the ground of the oscilloscope probe, and just wander that round my circuit and see if anything's singing like a canary. And right. you'll, you'll just see, you know, on the oscilloscope, you'll, you'll just see, you know, whether you're picking up a, a lot of radio noise or not. So that's a really good way of just seeing it's not foolproof at all but it will start you know is an area quiet or is an area noisy and if you don't find any noise you might detect gold sorry say again and if you don't find noise you might detect gold oh well who knows <laughs> who knows um uh, yes hordes <laughs> of gold look at looking for looking for rubbish you didn't know was there metal detecting <laughs> um, is there anything at the level that, of stuff that MakeSpace could buy that an individual might not? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I've got here, and I mean, this is this is about 3,000 quid, unfortunately, but this is Anne Ritsu's Spectrum Analyzer. Um, so, you know, I can put a probe onto this. I mean, some of this radio equipment, uh, I kid you not, is the price of a, price of a house in Cambridge. Mm. You know, so some of it is shockingly expensive. Uh, I mean, this I bought this second hand. It still cost me three grand. Um, so, you know, uh, I think probably a, you know, for make space for us in Cambridge, uh, you know, a nice coily wire, you know, somebody could make a nice 3D printed handle with a coily wire in it. You know, it's like a search probe. Okay. You know, um, that would be quite nice, you know, if, if, if anyone's sort of tinkering, you know, doing any of like, you know, little startup businesses here in, at Make Space, which is, where a lot, which is why I want to resign there, of course. A small startup doing electronics. Buying specialist equipment like, like this and Ritsu, uh, I think it's probably out of scope, if I'm honest. Okay. Well, um, worth mentioning, you can get some, you know, quite, uh, quite sort of, noddy or sort of old equipment spec specy analyzers on ebay yeah. for uh, uh, in the low few hundreds yeah i think uh, i've got one here hang on so i'm just walking away from my camera look still hear you all um i used to have one but now i don't i used to have um, um oh what's it, is it digital radio you can use some of those digital radio um mm -hmm. You know, like USB digital radio modules, you know. The, the, oh, thing. right. Yeah, the software fun radio jobs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can use those. In fact, in fact the, the issue with those, um, you can use those for searching, um, but they're, they're, they're very narrow band. So, I know, so you, you do end up, um, how can I say, uh, having to scan all the frequencies, you know, manually in order to try and button on something. What, what sort of range should we be looking for? Range? Yeah. Uh, with with the... For the specy analyzers. I mean, I mean, if we're looking to buy one, oh, what, gosh. What, what sort of lower and upper frequency? Well, OK, we so for? let's go back to here. So if we're talking about radio emissions, let's talk, we have, you know, there's radio immunity as well, which is the, the other can of worms. So, oh, hang on. Um, yes, there we go. So with radio em emissions, we're going from 30 megahertz up to one gigahertz. But my, most problems that I see 
are usually up to well this is about here that's uh, about 300 most problems i see are usually between 50 megahertz and about to 300 megahertz that's where that's where you see most issues at least that's, yeah, that, that, that's going to be mcu sort of clock speeds isn't it Yes, uh, well, power supplies usually have a broadband issue just here at about 50 megahertz. Mm -hmm. So this this lump here is probably caused by the power supply. Uh, no, Radio 4 is up here somewhere, you know, <laughs> along with Radio 1 and Radio 3, but no, nobody cares about Radio 3. Uh, yeah, but so for make space, uh, yeah, one of those um, digital radio things and you know, let's let's you know someone knows how to print uh, a nice search coil housing. I think I think that would be perfect for that for uh, for Cambridge make space. So okay, let's move on a little bit uh, because the other side of Freedom. oh yeah. Can I just ask what determines when a product needs radio compliance testing? Right, very good question. It's it's a legal requirement. It's not an option. Of any electronics? Any electronics. Well, uh, let me uh, quantify that very slightly for us. <laughs> it's, um, it's the final product is what you're looking at. So um, if you're selling a component, so technically something like a Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, or a PC motherboard is technically a component and therefore does not have to comply the onus is then on the final product if you were selling it of course uh the final product whether it's a digital watch a calculator a computer a space rocket <clears throat> um you have a legal requirement to comply with radio emission standards and those standards uh come in two parts um it's, what, it's called class A and it's called class B. Uh, class A is for industrial equipment. Uh, class B is for domestic and what you could call light industrial. Light industrial being an office or in this case with you know the supermarket scales, for example, uh, it's called class B. And those limits are basically enshrined in law and they're international. And um, th there's no, there's no leeway on, um, well, I'm, I'm selling this and it's only going to be used, you know, in the middle of a field away from a million people. Um, well, that just doesn't cut it when it comes to legislation. It's, it's really black and white. So, I, yep. so if I'm soldering a few components onto a PCB for, to go on a Raspberry Pi, that would technically qualify as a component? Yes. But if you're then going to sell it, you know, as, as a product, let, let's say Kickstarter, for example, you wanted to sell it as a product and make a business, then you'd have to, that whole thing as an entirety, the finished product would have to comply with legislation of EMC standards. Right. But for tinker time, you know, on your desk, nobody cares. Yeah. And and you, you alluded earlier to if you don't spend your thousand pounds on pre-compliance testing, then it could cost you 20 or 30,000. Oh, is that, easily. Is that because that's what you get fined if you sell a product and haven't done no, it? No, no, it'll be the cost of putting the job right. Um, after you've made your product I've got I've got I've got so many horror stories but yeah. uh, I worked for a company I came in at the end a bit like a bond movie I, in fact, I've got a bond movie story for you next actually um, <laughs> well it might be bond it might not be we'll pretend it's bond um, but I came in on the end of a project and um, they'd they'd done the design the electronics the PCB they'd put it in a metal box they thought that would solve all their problems they bought a tablet uh, they'd written all the software for it. They'd done it. The customer paid a hundred thousand pounds for this piece of work. Uh, I then joined the company and said, right, let's, you've got to now test it. And I'm not kidding because the boss did complain to me one day that it had cost quarter of a million pounds to put right. Wow. And it's all because they didn't spend the time and money 
at the start. So uh, it's called pre-compliance. And if you are developing product, um, you know, to sell, um, it's money very, very well spent. And you kind of got to get bitten by in, in order to appreciate the, the true value of it. Let's move on. So the other side of emissions is immunity. And uh, my time's gone out the window, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's good to talk. So the other end of side of say emissions is immunity. And so, and that's rather than your equipment emitting radio, it's your equipment being susceptible to radio. So whereas in here, you know, we had this piece of equipment emitting to the antenna, this time I'm going to turn it around and we're going to emit signals and we're going to see how our piece of equipment performs. And we're going from, I believe it's 150 kilohertz this time, one frequency at a time up to one gigahertz. And we're looking for that piece of equipment um, flinching. Will something go wrong? Depending on what it is, if it's medical equipment, it better not go wrong. But if it's a computer or a mobile phone or, you know, or a watch, it's allowed to go wrong, but it must then recover. In the case of the scales, which we designed for the supermarket, we found that at 400 megahertz, suddenly the banana got heavier. And then when the frequency came away from 400 megahertz or thereabouts, the banana went back to the correct weight. So there was clearly a problem with um, somehow the radio waves were getting into the product and basically screwing it up. And usually these signals get into your product over cables. So going back to what we were talking about earlier about screening, we had screened power cable and a screened data cable coming off the scales to, you know, to, to the checkout display. And the signals going, oh, and, and of course a USB, which then went to the, the, the till system, it was called a POS, point of sale. So we had three cables and the radio all screened and the radio signals were getting onto the cables, into the product, cost, causing the bananas to suddenly get heavier at a certain frequency. And what you've got to remember with a scale is that you're weighing money. And therefore, they have to be absolutely bang on correct, and they can't do that. Uh, and of course, you know, as I was saying earlier, if you can fix these designs in the product, it's definitely better. Um, I mean, some of the other issues which we've had, I've made a little list here. Um, issues we found with immunity is, uh, I don't know if anyone from ARM is on the call, but uh, we actually could hang an ARM processor through radio emissions or radio immunity testing. Uh, we actually came in over the I2C and caused the entire chip to lock up. So we ended up putting some filtering on the board. And we'll look at that, how we do that in just a moment. Put some filtering on the board to take the frequency noise out to stop the chip hanging. And one of my favorite stories here, which I've got a picture just to uh, just remind me, this happened about 15 years ago. Um, it wasn't this particular picture, but we'll pretend it is. But down at Pinewood Studios about 15 years ago, um, they were doing a boat show. I got, I, when you ever go to a test site, you get loads of stories, and this is my favorite one. <laughs> and uh, they were doing a boat chase scene, and suddenly all the pyrotechnics blew up on site. Let's say it was this one for argument's sake. It wasn't. And so they took the pyrotechnics off for testing and they found at a certain frequency, the pyrotechnics would click and cause, and cause everything to go off. So armed with this information, they went back to Pinewood and reported, look, this is, this is what caused it. So they did an investigation down at the studios and they discovered half an hour before the pyrotechnics accidentally all went off. Somebody had ordered a taxi. When the taxi arrived with his clearly slightly dodgy illegal radio, 
It was the taxi radio that set off the pyrotechnics. So um, radio immunity and emissions are a genuine problem for sure. And uh, say, you people say they design for it and it's okay, but nothing beats testing. Uh, if you want some home equipment for, you know, something cheap and cheerful for testing radio immunity, um, one of the things, the best one you can do is probably get one of those, um, I think they're like piezo lighters for, for, uh, for, for gas heaters. <clears throat> you know, they, I think they're like a quartz or something, don't they? In, in that you press a button and you get like this little crackling out of it. Uh, if you go around your board with that, in you know, cables and try and induce a signal. That's a pretty cheap way of uh, seeing, you know, do we have a problem before you go to the test site, but nothing beats going down there and, you know, talking to the people who got the equipment. And like I say, you know, the cost of the equipment, some of it's the price of a house and it's just a silly box on a desk. So uh, it's not cheap. Uh, the last Testing thing- Testing for immunity, a legal requirement as well. Yes, it is. Yes, uh, the standards are EN, uh, well, it's now UKCA, of course, now we're out of Europe, uh, 550, I think, 22, and 55024. Thanks. Uh, yes, and th they, come, they come as a package, you know, although they're separate standards, and um, yeah, you have to do the rest. In fact, when you go to America, uh, I think America, which is FCC, North America, it's just the emissions they worry about. I think it's part 15, I think, of the FCC standard. But when it comes to immunity in the States, um, that's more about product reliability. And, and, that's not, and that's not covered in the same way. That's just... Just, uh, yeah, just wondering, um, you know, of, of, often on many products, it says uh, FCC and then it, then it says... Um, this product must accept uh, any interference, including that that causes undesired operation. I've always wondered what that meant. Uh, yeah. it's, I think it's, it's, what we're, it's what we're saying is uh, it has to be immune to, because FCC doesn't cover radio immunity. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's more about you know, product reliability at that level. That, that's their point of view. And, you know, just before I get on to ESD, I predict that in the coming years, this radio emissions and immunity is going to get a whole lot worse, uh, as in harder to pass. I think particularly on the immunity, because the emissions are pretty much written in stone and very hard to change. But for immunity, it's a little, oh, it's not woolly, but it's, it's more flexible, you know, Per per uh, per country, really, you know, or per state, or you know, European bloc. Uh, I mean, I do know. Um, I don't know where these numbers come from, but you know, the computers you're on today, um, they they will fire five. Uh, is it, I can't remember what sort of the units. I think it's five volts per meter. I think for your computer, uh, the scales which we developed were 12 volts per meter and that's why we had problems and we found we could cause the arm chip to hang and the banana to get heavy uh medical devices is now 28 volts per meter so you know the standards on immunity are getting tougher and tougher and the place to fix it is in the design and i don't believe say as an engineer um trying to fix it with sticking tape and you know gaskets and copper tape everywhere and trying to spray the inside of a plastic box with some expensive ferros exotic material um you know they're all exotic sticking plasters that just frankly just fall off um but yeah right let's move on shall we um last thing here to share with you is on esd right this is the silent killer of electronics this, this is the one where you don't know you've done it and then it falls over sometime later and you have absolutely no idea why. 
so this is a, a picture I got off the internet um, of a chip which has very clearly been zapped with ESD. So it's wor still working, but sometime later in the field, the thing will fall over. And it's all because you did something, you know, maybe a month ago when you when you just walked across the carpet because you were in a hurry. And <clears throat> this is this is a real, real problem. Now, the way I fix this in my designs is I always use uh, these things here now in my designs. Where's my board gone? There it is. So on my board, uh, on, on all my data lines, so on my data lines here, um, we can see that. Uh, oh, they're better on this one here. So these tiny, these are 0603, they look like tiny resistors. You know, and they're, they're just a few pence each. And if you can see the tracks, hopefully. But I put one of these on every single data line. And I also put it on my power line. And these are good for 8,000 volts. And I, I've at ESD shoved, you know, plus minus 8,000 volts into these things and never had a problem. And uh, consequently, I've, I've never had a board fail because I've put this measure on boards will then fail because you know it was it was mishandled, you know, by, by touching chips when when you weren't correctly grounded. But then how do you then wire these things up? I've got one end of it nailed to a a pin or the power supply. What do I do with the other end of it? So uh, this is the final number if you want to look that up at all. It's 183 eight nine six six so how do i wire these things up well in my example here for this board here i call it a dirty ground so it's a track around the edge of the pcb that that, that connects ultimately to the actual zero volt or the ground um, connectivity what you don't do is actually loop it up like that. Okay, always make sure you've got, you've got a break in it somewhere. So the test house tells me. <clears throat> and so if there is, if you do get a, a 8,000 volt zap to it, uh, these Varista chips, which is what they are, will then just basically shunt the ESD signal away safely to ground and so they don't end up going straight into your chip and uh, um, causing causing that damage as i say you won't see that damage straight away you'll 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 find it'll happen in a month's time and you'll think you know did i write some code wrong did i solder something wrong and it's none of the none of the above um so that that's on the two layer board We've done that. So, and on the four layer board, which I've got here as well, on the four layer board, I've just got a track running around the edge to, to, the, to the socket. Um, so yes, uh, ESD big, and that's, and that's also a legislative requirement as well to comply with electrostatic discharge for sure. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, like medical equipment, for example, you know, you, you wouldn't want to, you know, your, your, your heart monitor to suddenly stop because, you know, somebody touched something they shouldn't have done and caused it to break. As I say, I, I put these devices everywhere in my designs. Every data line's got one of these. And I also put them on the power, power lines. Uh, the USB, I put them on as well. You know, the, the three, three on the USB, one on the power, one on the data plus, one on the data minus. How do they do the testing out of interest? Sorry? How do they do the testing for this out of interest? For um, ESD, uh, there's two tests. Um, one of them is called an air discharge, which is it's like a gun. And it, it, it literally looks like a gun and it's, so they, they, they essentially will probe, you know, and try and discharge to your board. 
Um, to, particularly if you've got any 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 sockets exposed, um, that they'll run this test. Uh, the other one is uh, that's not it's, it's it's induced actually. That they'll try and induce. That's not ESD then. They'll try and induce it over, over the cable. So if you've got a cable, I think if it's more than one point two meters, don't ask me where these numbers come from. Um, that they'll put it like in this in this clamshell. And then try and induce all this noise into it to see, you know, does it flinch? Does anything awkward happen? Sounds painful. Oh, yeah, it's painful. Um, it's it's heartbreaking. <laughs> it's what it is, you know. Um, but it's it's a pre-compliance. Um, you know, it's time well spent. So, you know, so when I've gone through this pain barrier. You know, with design, you know, essentially what happens is, you know, you, you make your product, whatever it is, you skip off to the EMC test site, you put it in the chamber, you run out and you wait 40 minutes for to see to see what it's like. And usually the first time you've designed it, it's usually a box of spanners. Then, you know, you'll start playing around with ferrite clamps and, you know, soldering things on and realizing that you shouldn't have cut the ground plane up at all because i've made that mistake which is why i say one ground plane no mess and uh yeah and then you'll end up having to re-spin the board i know and we use ets you know they'll even say come down for a cup of coffee and we'll look at your design before you even re-spin your board and then you go back and test it and yeah things are usually better the second time not always perfect you know, you might have a third trip, but it's just something you've got to factor into to your design. So, you know, but obviously, if you're not designing anything product wise, if it's just your hobbyist, then you're still looking at good design practice. I still say go for a four layer if you can. Um, I say I personally don't see much saving in two layer, uh, particularly if you've got a lot of stuff on the board. Um, I did look at the cost of two layer versus four layer for us, and you can expect a two a four layer board. Wherever the board's gone, there it is. You can expect a four layer board, say, to cost twice the price of a two layer. But if you tried to put that on two layer, this board would be considerably bigger, and therefore your cost saving is probably now in the bin. Um, because they also then need a bigger box for it. So going two layer, in my view, is generally a false economy. Right, okay. Um, well, look, so that's a bit of a whirlwind tour of um, reliability. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more to it, of course. You know, the next time we'll talk about PCB layout and some tips and tricks of uh, the other black art of getting layout the design itself right. Is there anything which you'd like me to go over again? Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Um, related to the cables being a problem, something where I've seen sort of small and medium electronics fail is the sockets on the board um, pulling loose from the board. Um, yeah. Most people have noticed it with USB ones, but I guess it could happen with any. Yeah, um, look, I can tell you a story about cables as well, actually, not many people know. Um, well, a few things actually with, with yeah, ca cables are also, you know, sockets, are, as you rightly point out, are also the undoing of a, a lot of things. Um, I know in wind turbines, for example, they have to monitor the integrity of the cable because a, a poor connection in a wind turbine power socket will cause localized heating. So um, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, I can tell you that um, on the Beagle 2 that landed on Mars in 2003. And uh, if you wanted a socket, because uh, my uncle was the chief engineer, he told me this, if you wanted a socket, you had to put together a very strong solid argument for it because uh, the, the default was no sockets. 
it's it's all wired straight to the board. I guess they didn't want it to fall out, and it's obviously weight as well. Yes, I'm thinking particularly of the socket pulling loose from the board and breaking the tracks. Yeah. Sometimes I've seen it happen. It's all been micro USB sockets. They yeah. Think that way. But how do you anchor it properly? Are there ways you can improve that sort of thing? Right. Yes. Well, yes, 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 yes and no. Yes, and yes, and yes, I suppose. So uh, on, on what I have here, actually, um, it's just a very good question, actually. Um, so uh, on this board here, so th these are surface mount uh, micro USBs. Yes, exact, that's exactly the sort of thing I'm thinking of that I've seen come loose. Yeah, come loose. So I've, I've, I've had people rip them off. <laughs> In fact, um, so th this one here, which is a little bit more, so this one here is a through hole. In fact, on the scales we designed, we originally had surface mount um, USB sockets. And uh, yeah, they, they pulled them off. <laughs> so we ended up having to change them for through hole. I mean, what I will say is, uh, if, if it's going to be a fit and forget, then I think a surface mount is probably acceptable. Uh, I have come round to the view, I'll be honest, that uh, if it's going to be in and out, or like these USB ones, and these are, these are pretty tough jobs, these printer type ones, USB B. Um, I think going through hole is then the answer for sure. I mean, it's the same with, um, we're going here, I mean, screw terminals, you can get surface mount screw terminal sockets. Um, but again, you know, these are through hole. It's all about mechanical stability, isn't it, really? I, th I think that's what you have to consider and um, yes, how often is things going to be in and out of that socket and is it going to be waved around but yeah I I've had my fair share with the with the USB micro ones uh you can get obviously get through whole versions uh a recent product of just finished um you know the prototype had surface mount and guess what two of them got pulled off so you know had to uh I had to work out how to put the socket back on, and in the respin, um, the surface mount's been replaced for through hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the other thing I will add with through hole is <clears throat> if you've uh, say if you are designing something for sale and there's going to be a lot of them. Um, try and avoid having surface mount on the bottom side of the board because through hole and surface mount will put the production cost up if it's on the same side. Because one side it's pick and place, and on the other side it's it's a wave flow that it has to go through, you know, like 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 a surf wave if you like. So having a having a, a wave of solder over a board where you've got components. Uh, isn't going to do it any favours at all. There are ways around that, but not every test site has, or manufacturing site has that capability. So often these might usually be soldered by hand. <clears throat> so you're adding another process to the manufacturer, which you've got to bear in mind, and that process comes at a cost. Um, I've got a quick one. Um, if you got a second. Yeah, 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 please, anything. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of experience with this type of thing. So the type of, um, like when you said about putting in capacitors to, say, reduce spikes in particular parts of your scan, um, is that just to reduce how quickly um, a source of, to radio energy is being created so you don't get such a sharp change or is there something else so with capacitors um in fact on this board here uh, i wonder if i can zoom in for us let's see if we, we can we can look at uh let's see if we can zoom is that zoomed for you yeah it's uh bigger a little bit fluffy but I, I... yeah but... <laughs> Can't have it all, I'm afraid. That's all right, it's better than I. No, that's that's as I think that's as good as it's going to get. 
So, you're right. so on, on here, so I've got capacitors two here, for example, we spoke about decoupling a uh, uh, couple of talks ago. So, uh, so I always put these capacitors um, essentially as close as I can to the power pins of anything. So this is an arm chip here and there's, a, there's usually a power pin in each corner. And so I've got um, and then right next to the power pin, some decoupling. So that, that'll help suppress noise getting out onto, onto, onto the power plane and radiating to everything. And is that, that's um, so interrupting the power line into the chip, is it? No, no, let me, let me, let me draw it for you. So uh, let me just zoom out for you a second. Right, let me just draw it for you. Uh, I have to get rid of that, there we go. Right, so, if this is our chip, this is our main processor chip, whatever it may be. Okay. This is our plus 3.3 volt power rail, of course. And then this is our zero volts. Oh, hang on a sec. There it goes. Out of this is there we go. I think you can see that okay, can't you? you. So yeah. what, what I'll tend to do is put the capacitors as close as I can to the pins. I'm going to put some numbers on these in just a moment. And what I'll tend to do, I'll put them as close as you can. So if there were two power pins, I'm on an arm core, there'd probably be four. I'll clearly add a lot more capacitors. So it's not just case of one capacitor. It's going to be multiple capacitors. And I'll make one of these one nanofarad and the other one will be a hundred nanofarad. And it doesn't matter whether it's just a not gate or whether it's the processor, put that across everything. It'll suppress the noise coming, you know, basically electrically conducted noise coming off the chip and then basically getting out, you know, out to the outer world on the cable. Uh, and another, another anecdote for you, um, designed a tire measuring system for measuring the profile on car tires using lasers so, some years ago, about 10 years ago now. And uh, one of the issues they, they had was there's getting radio noise coming off at harmonics of 27 megahertz. Now, it turns out that the width of a car is perfect for radiating 27 megahertz. So the cable had to be a certain length because of the car tires, but the length of the cable was perfect antenna quarter wavelength of the frequency being generated on the board. And uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's it's a genuine problem. And because you can't see it, you think life, it's okay. But, you know, to come back to your capacitor question, um, always make them as close as possible. In fact, on, on this design here, uh, this is a speech mode power supply circuit. And this had a noise problem, which was causing me issues at around 50 megahertz. And uh, chap in Cambridge uh, used to be a MakeSpace member, Steve Wiseman. So I'll, I'll give him credit for this. He said, put a 10 nanofarad capacitor right there on the board. It's, it's, it pointed where to put it on the board. And we put it there, retested it, and it was absolutely right. It fixed the problem. So that was a 0.1 penny capacitor in the right place on the board solved the problem. And so now I always put a, right, a 10 nanofarad capacitor right there on my design and uh, never had the problem since. How do you choose which nanofarad value? Because I've seen 100 nanofarads used ubiquitously. <laughs> yeah. And on some data sheets for chips I've used, they also have a 10 microfarad yeah. alongside it. But you've got a one nanofarad got, there. Right. I've not seen that before. Okay, because it looks like this. 
frequency and impede. There we go. You can see that okay, can you? So when you start getting yeah. into high frequencies with capacitors, their performance looks something like this. So above a certain frequency, depending on the capacitor value, that they'll start to lose their capacitance and inductive features start to become evident. And that might be, I'm not sure which way around it is, but that might be one nanofarad uh, that way. I think that might be right. And then the 100 nano looks something like that. that. So by, by using two capacitors, I, I get a much better um, noise rejection because I'm, I'm relying on the physical properties uh, of the materials is what I'm doing. So one nanofarad in parallel with 100 nanofarad is only 101 nanofarads because it, it's capacitors you just in um, to add them you put them in parallel for a resistor it's in series yeah yep um so you think well 100 nanofarad or 101 sure, surely that's irrelevant well yeah at, at a raw number but we're just remember we're we're using the high frequency values uh or physical properties of the capacitors and i think um this might be something like uh, around about the 300 megahertz it really depends on the capacitor if you look at the ceramics uh you get x7r uh 5xr nop capacitors cog capacitors it's all about the materials and if you're using a high rf stuff you tend to go for what's called an npo oh and an nop npo i think um or cog and it's all about what material they've made, they've made the dielectric out of. So, so they have different kind of sweet spots, if you like, that they're Oh, spots. yeah. And is that, yeah. that got the information in the data sheets for the capacitors? Uh, you might find some hint of it. I mean, if, if I'm actually, say, got crystals on the board, um, you know, it's possible if I'm using crystals, you know, I, I might I might I might go down to maybe a hundred picofarads, you know, if I'm using if, if I'm doing this anywhere near a crystal. Uh, because a crystal will have you know, this will this will be even higher for, for a crystal. So the smaller the capacitor, you do start to move it up. So it's all one big trade-off for sure. But the bare minimum is a hundred nanofarad. Uh, you probably can use ten nanofarads if you know if you've got it to spare. Yeah. So the so the board that I was copying an open source design and they had a ten microfarad and a hundred nanofarad. Ten micro. Yeah. I presume this ten micro is doing some completely different job. Yes. There. Yeah. So ten micro will be uh, well. That's another good point actually. Yeah, we could have spoken about that a little bit. Uh, so a ten microfarad capacitor. Um, will be for what we call bulk capacitors. That's to keep the power rail nice and steady. So, you know, if, you, if you're switching LEDs on, LEDs say drawing 10 milliamps, you know, you'll start to see dips in the power supply, which mm. isn't a good thing. <clears throat> so what I'll tend to do, uh, well, let's say on the two layer, probably more the four layer board, <clears throat> is I'll sprinkle, when I do the initial design, I'll put a 10 nano, usually about a 10, you know, 10 to 22 uh, microfarad. I'll put one in each corner, one here, one here, one here, one here, and one in the middle. In fact, I can even see it, there it is. As a starting point, just to try and you know, ensure that the power rail doesn't wander about, because you, yeah. you don't want a flaky power supply. So that uh, capacitor, in fact, if we go back to our circuit here, there we go. So yeah, so I probably would, you know, put a, maybe your 10 microfarad on as well. But that wouldn't necessarily have to be close to your, your chip. You know, these capacitors absolutely do. 
but this one here and sometimes it's called a reservoir capacitor yeah and you do their electrolytic uh which are the big can ones because they're they're super cheap um but you know if, if you're doing something um you know more let's say commercial um i'll probably go for a ceramic so you know my designs here um there we go so these these are those big capacitors you were just talking about yeah and i tend to go for ceramic um you know because they're usually smaller <laughs> you know I, I i like my designs to be compact the more compact you can make your design definitely uh the the more reliable it'll be as well yeah and you, you've got decoupling capacitors kind of one per power rail or what one per pin on that arm chip oh yeah um i had a board design where i had two um they were um i2c ics uh one was a pulse switch modulation chip and one was a, a digital io chip yeah. and because of their location on the board and the kind of physical layout the decoupling capacitors were almost side by side on the board. Yeah. Um, and they were as close as I could get them to the power rails. But yeah. I did wonder, kind of, did I need both of them when they were? No, no, it's a very good point. And I, I do this trick but when I'm designing a board and something else, you know, in terms of reliability, um, you can't see it in that one so well. Uh, well. I'll make sure I cover this next time. But the other thing you want to make sure when you've when you've um, in fact we can use uh, where is it? Bear with. I think it's oh right. Hang on, we can use this right. So um, well, a couple of things. Right. So first thing to answer your question, uh, I think you're absolutely right. What you said. So if you had a chip, chip one. And if it was physically close to chip two, then yeah, I I will, if they're physically close, I very often will, let's say, share the, um, the capacitors. But when I design the schematic, the circuit diagram, because in the circuit diagram, they're not physically next to each other. Yeah um I'll, I'll i'll add it then but when i come to the layout yeah very frequent particularly when i'm doing like these high density layouts like i've done here you know I, i've clearly got chips right next to each other yeah so i think well hang on they could buddy up and do so you, do you test for noise on your power lines to see how effective this is um or do you just kind of if you don't see problems, then you it's good to go. I've kind of got to the point in my design career where the technique I'm now employing, and I'm, which I'm sharing with you here, has pretty well stood the test of time. And I haven't these days had power supply issues. Where I have had power supply issues is when I have, like this board here, which is two layer, where I've tracked, so um, I can't find it now. But where, where I've tracked the power rail. Here we go. So on on this design here, hopefully that's not gone blocky. And you can still see it, okay? Yeah, it's clear. <clears throat> Fantastic. We've got the bandwidth back. So on this board here, there's not really a lot going on. So sure enough, I, I've tracked it because um, it's just a little development board I was tinkering with. So I, I took the decision that, well, there's very little on here. I can probably get away with it. If I did that on this board, I guarantee it, it, it'll, it'll be a cataclysmic disaster. It would be an absolute mess. Um, and I, I have made that commercial mistake. I picked up a project of somebody else who had done it all on two layers and tracked it. At the back of my mind, I knew I should have done four layers, but I followed their, their example and did it on two. And sure enough, the power rail was an absolute box of spanners. <clears throat> when, I, when I redid it all and put it on four layers, 
things were miles better. You know, if I had a power rail, so going back to this one here for this board, having a, like the, this is the club sandwich, the buried layer as a solid rail didn't have the problem at all. But the one thing which I haven't pointed out here is that when you have a power plane, and this is another reliability thing, be mindful of how many veers. So when I'm doing the layout, let's say I've got, oh, let's get rid of that so you can see better. I've got two capacitors next to each other. Yeah, that's an 02063 capacitors. I'll, 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 even, I'll buddy up the veer as well. So I, I can reduce the number of veers, you know, yeah. on the board as well. Because if you if you turn that power plane or the ground plane into too much of a, a bit of Swiss cheese, for want of a better analogy, you, you'll just end up making the problem just as bad as if you tracked it. Because these veers will have a, a kind of insulation ring or a, a gap in the copper well, on exactly. the layers so they can pass through without... Yeah, exactly. And in fact, you know, if if uh, the veers themselves is a power, if you have a lot of them too close together, that's why I'm very careful, you can end up putting a slot in, in your ground plane. Yeah. And, and then, of course, any return current has to go around to get back home. And then you, and then you start having emission problems again. On my the most complex two-layer board, I ended up filling all the available top and bottom space with, with ground plane and then link yep. veers between them because I read it was good practice. It uh, absolutely is. Whether it was necessary for the sort no, of board I was doing, I, I really don't know. No, no, you're absolutely bang on the money there. And that's in this two layer board. That's exactly what I've done here. So all these, all these little dots you see here, uh, these are veers connecting. Um, so, well, and this is thing I, I see a lot, um, you know, from companies where they've designed the, the, the board, they've tracked it and they haven't done an infill and there's, an, there's all sorts of good reasons for infill. Uh, I mean, for infilling, for starters, um, it's, it's more environmentally friendly because you're not dissolving as much copper away. Uh, if you've got a big board and you don't infill, you can end up with a copper imbalance on the board, which could cause it to warp. And if, if it then warps uh, and then you bolt it in, you may cause components to ping off the board and that's not a good look. But you're absolutely right to infill, even two layers or even four layers, infill and then knit the top and the bottom together with veers. So the way I design this if, um, is once I've done my, my layout is I'll change the grid reference, the grid on my board to five millimeters. So I can easily then just drop veers in at five millimeter spots. Uh, and then you know, just make them ground. And, uh, and then I, I, I can then effectively knit the top and the bottom together. And that infill will also reduce your, your radio emissions for a fact. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that because the, the, this linking the, um, the infills so that you've got kind of short current paths, that's, that's yep. about power quality rather than radio emissions, isn't it? Uh, well, it's both. Uh, you're, you're creating a much better return path for the electrons, um, but you're also re reducing the the emissions because you've you've got that ground coupling around all, all your tracks, or, yeah. or at least you know to a degree you have anyway. I mean, obviously on this on this board there's, there's clearly uh, quite a lot of grounding going on around the components. Cle clearly on this board there, on at least on the top layer, there's significantly less. Yeah. But I've got that ground, I've got that, that club sandwich going on um, inside. When you have the ground and power planes, do you have to take into account um, capacitance between them and the tracks on the other planes? It depends on what on the frequencies. This is called uh, impedance matching, is what you're describing. Um, 
Yeah, if you've got high frequency signals, then yes, you will need to impedance match. And um, it's, there are equations, if you've got RF, so um, I'm not sure if I've got an RF circuit kicking about here. Well, here's one. What are the chances of that, eh? <clears throat> so uh, this is an RF board here. So it's not one I designed. It's one that's happened to have on my desk as, as if we'd planned this question. So on, on this, this, this is a, a GSM module and this is the, the antenna. And so, uh, because you know we're up at the what was it? Is it one point two gigahertz, I think, around that sort of frequency for radio for RF uh, mobile phone connect connectivity, uh, at least like on I think two G, which if not yet turned off. <coughs> um, so the the width uh, it's called track and space width. Uh, I could put on the back of here for us. So the track width, uh, which will color in there and the spacing when you get to RF frequencies um, that there, there is an absolute impedance between the two which we'll call Z for impedance and uh, yes uh, this, this is a whole new subject I was thinking of doing an RF uh, talk in uh, in series two because I think that'd be quite interesting um, to, to look at certainly we can look at GSM modules and so forth. And related to that question, if you want to put a small capacitor in and there's room on the signal plane, could you make it with a, a bit of copper land on the signal plane as one sheet of the capacitor and the ground plane as the other? Um, so you're going to be talking sort of sort of sub pico farads at that point. Okay, so you're not going to get a useful capacitor. No, not, not really. Out of the board it's, itself. No. Okay. I mean, what, what I will say is, you know, when you start getting to RF frequencies, then, you know, you, you, will, you, are, you are kicking, you know, even, you know, 868 megahertz, which is, you know, the, uh, the LoRa standard or the old analog TV. Um, you know, you, you, are, you are talking a few picofarads, uh, those sort of communication frequencies. And so layout then becomes really significant. When, we, when we're talking about, you know, these like AVR Arduino sort of boards and frequencies, you know, where we're talking a few tens of megahertz maximum, um, in, in my humble experience, it, it's less of an issue. In fact, I've never, I've never even had a problem, if I'm honest with you. Where, where, where I have the problems is, is when I get to RF communications. And so that's that's a whole new whole new subject. That's reassuring because it's a kind of Arduino type, sort of twenty megahertz and below that I've been experimenting with. Yeah, let me have a look at the chat. So, uh, right, just just looking through the chats here, which I sometimes forget to do. Um, oh yes, it's anyone seeing my feed freezing? <laughs> Glad someone spotted it. Um, okay, uh, I hope the pictures, yeah, it's, it's good if someone points out the, the pictures go jerky. So I, I live in Bottisham, uh, which is clearly too far out of town. Yeah, initially the feed, it wasn't just that the um, the overhead camera was, um, was had a low frame rate, that was a different problem. But in, at, at the start of the session, there were a couple of times when sound and video just stopped happening for several seconds and then came oh, back okay I, I i i can't really apologize for bt's um <laughs> mess up <laughs> you, you would have thought that'd be better these days oh you'd have to go and get starlink yeah 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 <laughs> or run a wire down the road but yeah so someone else in the comment here says you know they've used db uh at cottenham and mm -hmm. yeah go the extra mile to help yeah uh <clears throat> It's, it's good. They do. Some places I've been for EMC, they'll just hand you a box of ferrites and um, tell you to pick the bones out of that. <laughs> no, they were a lot better than that. Um, yeah, Way better than that. The, the one at Stebbing um, is the same. Um, the, the chap who runs it at Stebbing, a uh, chap called George Vasilia, who owns it. Um, this fella's an absolute demigod when it comes to EMC and immunity. 
uh, yeah, when when I've when I've had problems like like with the I two C hanging, for example, uh, when the ADC chips sung like a canary. Uh, yeah, he, he picks through the design. I'm sure they do the same at DB. Gave ideas on what to change. I said, go away, do that. Come back. We'll look at the design before you spin it. We'll then spin it and then come back and test. And yeah, um, it, it's great that the test site's there with all their experience because they've seen it all. And yeah, um, the, the horror stories you hear um, really are quite shocking. Just going uh, back to the legality of this testing, because I, at the moment I'm just making hobby boards for myself. But like a lot of makers, I've been looking at people selling kind of a few tens of their boards on Tindy. Yeah. And I never imagined that all of those Tindy sellers are doing, spending kind of a thousand quid on EMC testing before they start selling no, their, no, their not hobby boards. They never make any money. Not a, not a bit of it. They go to a Hong Kong, in quotes, testing house and get a piece of paper. Oh, um, yeah. And, 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 and that will allow you to self certify. But dear gods and little fishes, when you actually come to do the real testing, you find out, yeah, uh, yeah. they just got a piece of paper. Well, interestingly, um, just, just to touch on that a little bit more, um, so this, <laughs> this testing is one of my favorite subjects. Um, but yeah, uh, in testing EMC, uh, or, and electrical safety for that matter, is certainly in the Europe and the UK. It's now, it's now UKCA is the mark you have to put on products. Now we're <laughs> out of Europe. Um, uh, but it, it's self-certification. Mm -hmm. And also, you because between, I had to look into it, I did ask the government this and I, I never got an answer because I don't think they knew. I had to do a bit of, a, a few calls to get this answer. Um, but there, there is the, uh, it's, it's called the International um, Compliance Agreement, something like that. Well, it's because these standards are harmonized between Europe, EN, and other countries, certainly for radio emissions because, and, and electrical safety. If it's an IEC standard, the International Electric Commission, uh, there are variants for different countries, of course, you know, because we're in a different voltage to say North America, for example. Um, got a cat trying to open the front door. <coughs> My cat can open front doors. <coughs> he jumps on, he's, so he's having a go at the hand, I can hear him. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So there are harmonised standards, um, but uh, you no. Know, so if you comply with certainly within Europe, if you comply with say the UKCA standard. Um, Europe is self-certified still, so you can, you don't have to go through a, uh, like, like, like a, a test house in Europe to sell into Europe because there is this international agreement for harmonized standards. But when you go to North America, uh, it's a slightly different story because it's underwriters laboratories and it's a bit of a closed shop. Uh, you then do have to go to the test house, uh, which for us here in the UK, um, it used to be in Guildford, um, but it's now in, um, there's two, there's one in Frankfurt and there's one in Warsaw. And so if you are thinking of going international, uh, then I, my top tip is go to the Warsaw office um, because uh, there's less people, so it's a shorter queue. <laughs> but not a lot of people know that. Anyway, look, it's, it's just gone nine and people must be gagging for a cup of tea. So uh, I propose we close there for this evening. Um, but let me tell you to get your diaries out um, because our, our next gathering is the 2nd of June. And the next... Uh, plan is to talk about um, actual printed circuit board design itself. Um, we've touched on it a bit today, but um, I think it warrants a subject on its own. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dig well and truly deep into it. So um, if anyone's got anything specific they want on PCB layout, uh, either now's the time to say, or, or you can drop a note in the, in the Makespace comments.
So has anyone got anything in particular they'd like to cover on PALS on um, PCB layout next time? Um, I've, I've got something. It's not so much PCB layout, but just connecting PCBs together. Um, I wondered if at some point we could cover when, um, if you have uh, fairly long data cables between boards, um, when to um, use uh, isolation, like, you know, Ethernet isolating, transforming yeah. isolators and, and so on. Okay, okay. Um, high power and high voltage on PCBs. One moment, one moment. I'm just writing down the cable one first <laughs> for uh, long distance. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. Um, there are some answers to that. Uh, it's a very good answers to that. So you just mentioned about high voltage. And high current. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two of my first PCBs one of them will want to switch about 10 amps with FETs. And what and voltage? 12. 12 volts? Automotive, yes. Tw okay, 12. 12, 12 volts isn't a high voltage. <laughs> no, and the other one is that I uh, want to be able to put main solid state relays. Yeah. Which mains on a printed circuit board, although that would be a low current. 240 volts. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we can, we'll, we'll cover, we'll cover high voltage. Um, say I've, I've designed up to two and a half, no, 5,000 volts. So, um, yes, there's, we'll, we'll cover that In fact, the phrase, which we'll cover next time. If anyone wants to do any reading, it's called creepage and clearance. If anyone wants to read up on that. And, uh, there is a table. Uh, it's about one millimeter per hundred volts uh, for primary and I think that's secondary, I think. So we have primary and secondary. Okay, I will I will cover that next time. Is there anything else anyone wants to cover next time? Um, heat management would be Ooh. close to my heart with the work heat I've been doing with DC, yeah. DC converters. Yeah, good one. I'm getting you to write them now, you see. <laughs> Heat <laughs> management on PCBs. Yeah, good one, good one. Okay, so we've got, uh, well, cable isolation. Uh, we might have to cover that in series two. But uh, yeah, so we, we've got a couple of good topics. So uh, I was going to cover clocks uh, next time. Um, the clocks and data I wanted to cover next time for tracking a couple of other things i've come across that you may already be planning to cover one was about um sharp angles being points of failure for the fab house due to bits of copper flaking off and then sharp angles on what sorry uh, between tracks so where you've got two tracks that join at a very kind of shallow angle to each other if you imagine a Y where the, the kind of two forks of the Y are very close together. Right. So you get very, very sharp kind of triangular corner going into the join. Okay, right here. Okay. Um, it is apparently a significant cause of bits of um, copper coming loose during the fabrication process that have a tendency to resettle and cause shorts. Got you. So it was one of the reasons to avoid having kind of tracks coming in to another track at a very shallow angle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And, well, and the that... other one is just angles of kind of track bends, which I've heard can cause reflectance problems in signals. That's, that's exactly right. Yes. If you look at all my designs, in fact, these ones here, um, these are all 45 degrees. So, yes. Yes, I think the Cray computers used to do curves, didn't they? The world's most expensive love seat. <laughs> I don't know if they still make those Cray computers. Not in that form. No. All right. Okay. Should we close there? That, that's uh, that's a few topics. I I try. Uh, I found that on general, you know, about four, five maximum topics. Um, you know, each one being about five minutes ish. Um, you know, plus, plus, you know, any, any questions as we go seems to be about a fairly good format. Uh, I try not to pile too much in, otherwise, I just end up rushing it. 
Brilliant. OK, everybody, let's all go put the kettle on, shall we? Tonight's content was fantastic, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Radio. Right. OK. Good night, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.